time later that we could create something similar in Warrington where we could bring young people together where they could talk and explore their differences without any resource to violence. So that was the real payoff of that program for us. Ah, yes. Well, did you see the program? Did you? Well, it took me by surprise. I've never heard of this Red Action group. And uh, I actually asked Martin McGuinness about it, and he scoffed at the idea. He gave it no credibility. Now, the problem I've got with Martin is he says he knows nothing about the Warrington bombing. Do I believe him? No. But he says he doesn't know why Warrington was bombed. He doesn't know who did it. He knows it was the IRA. An active service unit of the IRA based in the northwest of England, but he says he doesn't know who authorised it. Or who, but he does say it was the IRA, and it wasn't some left-wing, you know, socialist-leaning group populated by English people. And that was the, that was what the program was suggesting. There were Englishmen who did the Warrington bombing, and they were like a franchise operation doing it on behalf of the IRA. He he scoffed at that. He said it was just be inconceivable that that would have been the case. So he says it was definitely the IRA. So well, they were already caught the other night, weren't they, at the lecture yeah. where they yeah. said no one yeah. knew that yeah. the Warrington Club was the IRA. Um, Nathaniel? Yeah, what are the odds that it would be put back in the future? Survival. That sounds a bit grim, doesn't it? But the main thing we have to work on is survival. I mean, we have a, have a wild stab in the dark how much money we our foundation needs to raise every year just to survive. Let's have a wild guess, any of us. No, it's not that much. <laughs> it's always good to aim high, isn't it? And you, and you put the, the questioner on the spot. No, it's not a million pounds, although I'd, I'd like a million pounds a year. But we have to raise 600,000 pounds a year just to stand still. And for a small charity in a medium-sized town like this, that's a big, big sum of money to raise. It's all very well, the national charity, you know, the Arts College, the NSPCC, and Guide Dogs for the Blind, and Lifeboats Associations, they've got deep, deep, deep reserves of money. We have no reserves at all. So if we don't raise money sufficient to meet our needs in four months' time, we're dead, we're gone. That's how close to the wind we are. And that's why we always have to constantly, constantly, constantly try and find new support and get financial backing. Because it's all very well people saying, we like what you do, we're with you, but unless people thump up a few bob now and again, we're dead. And that would be tragic, on top of a tragedy, if that charity died before I died. So I, my main ambition, to answer your question, is that the charity's still here when I go, and when my wife goes. Because it would, what a waste that would be to set it up and do brilliant work. And because of lack of money, we couldn't keep running. And the problem is, once you start employing people, you pay them a salary. And when you're in a grand building like the Peace Temple, it costs money to heat it and light it and maintain it when things get broken. And that's a lot of money even before you start doing the work to set it up for business. So I'll have a chunk of your pocket money later. <laughs> Maybe try and more questions. Do you know why the Tigers did Warrington? No. <laughs> well, I, I can keep it the short answer or I'll make it slightly longer. No, I don't. I mean, two and a half weeks before, they attempted to blow up a gas plant. You may know this, again, you may not, but your mum and dad would remember, on Winnick Road, you know the road leading up to the M62, um, where the health centre is on the left, what do you call it? Total fitness or whatever. Anyway, um, there was a gas uh, storage plant there where they had gas cylinders, you know, so long and so wide, sitting in a big stack. Commercial gas. And um, about two and a half weeks before the Bridge Street bombing, they attempted to blow that place up. And had they been successful, they'd have devastated a large area. They would have killed goodness knows how many people because it was residential housing across the street. All they succeeded in doing was in detonating one of these cylinders and it created a big fireball in the sky, um, which was captured on camera by a resident uh, filming from his bedroom. What he was doing with his camera on three in the morning. I don't know, and I won't go down that route, but anyway, he filmed it. And, um, and the BBC and the ITV and everybody showed it on the main evening news, because it was a big story in Washington. I remember Tim sitting with me and being spellbound, because it really was like a, it was a 
Christmas, it was like a nuclear explosion, a big ball of fire in the black night sky. The guys who did that were apprehended, fleeing Warrington, and were arrested, three of them. And the police officer took a bullet wound in his foot with pains when he arrested them. Why they did that, I don't know. I think the Bridge Street bombing probably was in retaliation for that attempt failing and for the three guys doing it being caught and locked up. But why they came to Warrington in the first place? Why Warrington? Why not Wigan or you know St Helens or Liverpool or Manchester? I don't know. But they just happened to use Warrington. Perhaps with the motorway network mm. places Warrington a kind of hub of the motorway. You've got M6, 52, 56. You can get in and out of Warrington. Well, apart from daytime, you can get in and out of Warrington quite easily. Daytime you wouldn't. But they obviously came in at night and did their deed then. Good question, Phil. From you know, there is no no direct translation of Cobb and Hill, but that the, the, the way to explain the argument one from the location that seems to get out of <coughs> seems to be there. Um, I also have a question. What about the negotiating terms of the Cobb and Hill agreement? So both the Liberal Philippines and the Liberal Philippines. Two things to, to provide uh, help for young people at risk of violence or getting involved in violence to turn away from violence because in the end all it brings is pain and suffering and there's no, there is no conflict anywhere that's ever solved by violence you may, you know, if I put a gun to your head now and said do you agree with me on everything I say you're going to say yes otherwise I might shoot you I don't change your beliefs but I don't change your mind all I do is make you feel afraid to say you agree with me to actually get a lasting understanding of people who are your enemies people you fear, you have to have a debate, that's a discussion, so there's no other way. So we have young people coming, um, and we have adults who are said, as I said a moment ago, who are victims of terror attacks, like I say, former civilian victims like us, military, police, and uh, victims of 7-7 in London and so on. So we have two streams, youth work and support for victims. Anyone else? What do you think has been the most successful piece of work that you've done, where you can actually see the impact of, of what you've been doing? School in Leeds. Six months after 7-7, seven, seven, uh, I was invited to a conference in Leeds to speak to an invited audience. And it was in Leeds because the four guys who put bombs on their backs and blew up three tube trains on a bus all came from West Yorkshire. And Leeds was the main city in West Yorkshire. So the conference was in Leeds, and I spoke, I was invited to speak to the audience about our work with Anglo, in, a, in an Anglo-Irish context and the success of our work. When I finished my talk, I was cornered by three guys who were officials, not officials, politicians, local councillors on Leeds City Council, who proceeded to tell me about this school called South Leeds High School and the fact that it was a school in danger of meltdown. It was a brand, well not brand new, but a five year old multi-million pound facility. Fabulous school. Created when they closed a predominantly white school and a predominantly Asian school and put them all into this new school. And from day one, there was considerable violence, considerable violence, black on white, white on Asian, black on Asian, and you, the right ethnic mix. So it was a rich cocktail. And the uh, police generally had six police officers in the school every day, every day a SWAT helicopter had landed on the school grounds on one occasion because things were getting so out of hand. So the proposition was, could our charity, our foundation, go in there and make a difference to that school? And if I keep the story fairly short, the answer was yes. And the school is now a fully functioning school, which gets good offset reports and has not got the problem at all that it used to have. And we did that by doing a leadership development program with three groups of 24 kids at a time. And the 24 kids were identified by the school as being the kids who were the opinion formers, the ones who influenced other young people, and we put them into the workshop. So 72 had gone through it after three workshops, and then they cascaded the lessons they taught, been taught by us down to the rest of the 1,500, 1,500 kids in their own way, using their own language, not our language. That school turned around, and the head teacher said it's a super shame. The governing body does, Leeds City Council does. And this is an aside, the head teacher was a big Everton fan. 
It's amazing, a project I really wanted to take on. Okay. That sounds amazing. It's actually, it's just such an amazing thing. It's such a shame that Northern Ireland doesn't have a facility like this because all the schools in Northern Ireland that we'll be doing our studies, most of them, if you're a Catholic, you go to a Catholic school. If you're a Protestant, you go to a Protestant school. You're not privileged like, it doesn't matter what religion or faith or creed or race you are in this country. And that well, because they do have integrated schools, well, it's not that very many. few, <laughs> very few. Yeah, we certainly accept the third. And the tensions that Colin referred to earlier on Coleraine, I know about those. I went to a school in Coleraine, um, and that that school, the, the work that was described there in Leeds, would have been would have been amazing. Well, of course, the the proposition up until very recently has been that they would have a peace centre in Northern Ireland, and it would be built on the site of the Maze Prison. Again, you may never have heard of the Maze Prison, but it's a celebrated prison where most, most of the IRA and loyalist prisoners who were convicted of serious crimes were in prison. It's a prison where they went through a whole host of terrible things. Hunger strikes, nine, I think nine, IRA men starved themselves to death rather than collaborate with the prison raiders.